right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome back from New Jersey on the other side of the country, uh, our friend and regular contributor, Andy Gold. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing great. Hello, everybody. Yeah. And Andy is a is a master sales trainer, sales consultant, and uh, uh, he's been working with biz people with helping with people's businesses, helping them selling their business, and 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 just generally helping to drive revenue and corporate sales culture. Because that's what we're going to talk about today. Is this idea of Have you ever been in an organization where? the while everybody says the sales sales is very important and the sales team is very important it it's not reflected in the overall corporate culture and sometimes i uh, you know the sales people will jokingly refer to the rest of the organization as the sales prevention departments right uh, and this is this is a weird and this is something that andy brought to my attention and i think it's very fascinating this is this is quite a common occurrence probably more common than you think because often it often it stems from where did the senior team come from? Is the CEO, does he have a sales background? Does he have an operational background? Does he have a financial background? They tend to, those, the background often tends to dictate the focus. But anyway, Andy, um, um, just diving straight in, just g give me a little bit of a background on, on on how you come across this or where you see this and why you think it's it's a, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah, so the headline here is kind of radical. Is it possible that corporate culture, which we extol and work towards, actually precludes selling, by which I'm referring to business development, growing new business? That's that's kind of like the radical thesis statement. And, you know, by way of background, I've been doing this practice for over 30 years. I've done it with the over 170 organizations. And I find this is a recurring theme that we prize, we work for corporate culture, and sometimes rigorous adherence to it precludes opening new customers. And why is that? Because corporate culture lacks an entrepreneurial component that's essential for opening new business. And this is especially so in small, medium-sized companies that are not branded. As an example, if somebody calls you and says, I'm from Apple Computer, or I'm from Microsoft, mm -hmm. and I'd like to share with you um, the latest and greatest ideas we have, you, you might take that call because the brand speaks to you. Right. But if another person was to call you, and have the same offer and say, I'm from no name company. I, I have all these great ideas. You might not take the call. So you, the bigger companies can grow despite not having an entrepreneurial culture because of the power of the brand and the power of their products. My comments are more focused towards small and medium sized companies where the entrepreneurial activity is essential in the sales force. Yeah, and and it's interesting, Andy, because it is uh, you would you would in some ways you would naturally assume that small medium businesses were more entrepreneurial by nature, but that isn't always that isn't always the case, as we as we said. And the and the problem often is that companies, when they start to grow a little, they scale by bureaucracy rather than scale by efficiency. Absolutely. And, and if, if I could add to this entrepreneurial thesis, mm -hmm. you know, what needs, what is needed? Well, one of our monikers here is bold vision, bold behavior, right? When you, when you come out of a sales call, if you haven't gotten what you wanted from it, a checking point was, were you bold enough in the vision you presented? Were you bold enough in the behavior? And so, um, it's my impression that entrepreneurial uh, behavior is not emphasized sufficiently. It's lacking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the timing is right, I thought I could present some ideas yep. as to what 
could be added if it's not already there. Mm -hmm. So how about a drill like this? What was the boldest behavior you did this week? What if the sales team got together every week and celebrated the boldest behavior? Well, if they haven't been doing bold behavior, maybe picking up the phone and calling an existing customer might be considered a bold behavior. But as you, consider, as you continue this kind of activity, it would include the cold calling, how did you get a breakthrough to somebody who wouldn't talk to you. If you were talking to a prospect mm -hmm. and um, they said, I'm good, they're going to stick with their incumbent source, did you escalate? There's a couple of ways to escalate. Mm -hmm. One is to be stronger, stronger messaging with the prospect, but the other is to escalate and go above their head. Well, that's crazy, says a salesperson. I don't want to ruin the relationship. What relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not buying from you, right? So what's the boldest behavior you did this week and make it kind of like a contest, make it fun? But my sense is, that all too often, this is not an implicit part of corporate culture mm -hmm. to step out of the box and do this sort of thing. Yeah. So that's one area in which the entrepreneurial uh, behavior is missing. Yeah. A second area in well, which... Just, it's just let me, on, on that one, uh, Andy, just let me on that one, because sometimes I think people who don't understand entrepreneurial behavior, don't understand entrepreneurship, etc., Sometimes I think they equate it with, you know, the Wild West, right? With, you know, people just running off and doing whatever. And and they want to try and control that behavior instead of saying, yeah, obviously there's limitations on what you can do and everything. But there shouldn't be limitations on ideas and maybe trying things and experimenting and all of that. And, uh, and I said, sometimes other parts of the organization, and maybe it's the corporate culture that, no, we want to have everything very tightly controlled and it stifles that. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. It's a great point. And if I could um, add another thought, yeah. uh, right now I'm thinking of a very process oriented company that had incoming phone calls. They did marketing and they did, um, they staffed the sales team just so it was efficient and it could handle all the incoming calls. And then the owners would complain they never do business development work. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason they never did business development work is because the staffing was set up so there was no time for business development work. Yep. And the reason they staffed it that way is they didn't trust the sales team to effectively um, take advantage of the unstructured time. Right. So they set it up in such a way and going back to corporate culture, very efficient, very process oriented. Um, and again, it precluded business development. Mm -hmm. So in that particular instance, we trained the sales team in entrepreneurial behavior to the point where we did some experiments, to use your, your framing. They got some results. So there was more time allocated. And eventually, we added to the sales team because there just wasn't enough time in a salesperson's day to do uh, new business development. So that's a, that's a good point you raised. Yeah, and actually the other, the other great point I, I, I just wanted to emphasize there that you raised a moment ago is um, the trust factor. The trust factor, and I think, that is, I think that's a critical one because you often see that in an organization in an organization that has a very strong maybe corporate culture maybe a strong operational culture or whatever it is is they don't trust their salespeople and they make it very obvious and therefore uh, you know that's that can be that can lead to conflict but also it's highly demotivating absolutely absolutely and i'm thinking of a couple of companies i know where very rigorous Great corporate culture, great processes, and the CEO complains they're not bringing in enough new sales. <laughs> and it, it's, you know, the salespeople are no good. And that, I mean, it's possible that in some cases they may not be, 
but it doesn't occur to the leadership that it's the very processes that are precluding selling. The processes are precluding selling. So what is the bold behavior that you do to bring in new opportunity? That was one thing we covered. And then the next part is how do you manage it? How do you manage uncertainty? What are the forward-looking metrics that you use? So in my experience, most of the metrics are backwards-looking or incomplete. So a backwards-looking metric is, um, or trailing metric is how did I do last month, last quarter? And you might think that if you say, well, what's in the pipeline, <clears throat> that's a forward-looking metric, but only insofar as it's properly qualified. So if we do the bold behavior, if we put new stuff in the pipeline, is a good stuff. An example, we had a salesperson we, I was coaching as part of a team. I actually work with four teams in this company. And in order for the salesperson to be successful, he needed to sell a million dollars worth of the product in a year. And it was at about at the halfway point of the year. He had $7 million in the pipeline. There was um, an estimated 20% close ratio. So you would have thought he was on track to do a million four. He should have been in good shape at the six month mark with five to $700,000 of business, but he only had $200,000 of business. And this is what came out in the one-to-one um, -one coaching is there wasn't proper qualification. So there was, there was opportunity in the pipeline, but the next piece of the entrepreneurial journey is what are the metrics you use? And we have a metric we call the PIK, the payment in kind. So the payment in kind is a behavior that's done by the prospect to show that he or she or they are committed to the process. So what might be an example? Oh, they filled out a credit application, they checked a reference. If you're not dealing with the owner of the business or the CEO, your contact introduced you, used some political capital in effect, they checked the reference, they came to, this is a big one. If, if, if a listener here has a manufacturing facility or even a distribution facility, the rule of thumb is if they come to visit you, and the further the better, yeah. you got a 50 to 75% chance of closing. That's a PIK. So it's not enough as part of the entrepreneurial um, exercise to be bold, open new opportunity, but then you need to manage the uncertainty. And one of the ways to do that is with PIKs, payments in kind. Here's another way. In your fact finding, discover the closing conditions. What are the closing conditions? The closing conditions are the series of conditions which, when met, result in the sale. Yep. And you'll have salespeople who will say, I have a great relationship with A or B or whoever. And, and uh, we'll say, okay, what, what are the closing conditions? I don't know what the closing conditions are. <laughs> well, did you get them to do a PIK? I'm not, I don't ask them to do PIKs. I got a great relationship. Yeah. I go to lunch with them. We play golf. Well, that's great. That's a social relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and what what I always love, Andy, on on that what you're raising there is, yeah, I mean, go out like you know, generate as many opportunities as you can, but at the same time, it's it's be discerning and qualify them properly uh, because otherwise you just have what I always say, the feel good funnel, you know, where you have tons and tons of stuff in stage one and it just trails away and you always convince yourself that, Oh, look, yeah, things are rough today, but look at, look at stage one. Oh, in six months time, we're going to be rocking. And of course in six months time, what do you have an inflated stage one and still having problems? Absolutely. So if I might return to the case history, I shared with you where the, the salesperson had $7 million of opportunity in the pipeline, 20% average close ratio, halfway through the year, should have been easy to hit a half a million 
only had 200,000. When we did the PIK test, when we asked, what is the PIK as a forward-looking metric that, that convinces you this is going somewhere? Very little, and the $7 million really collapsed to 700,000, and that's why he wasn't selling. Yeah, and and as you said, it's like that uh, you know the PIK what we call like uh, buyer actions, but it's one of those things. You're correct. It's it's if somebody comes and they come back and they come excited, say I had a fantastic lunch with Andy. He's super excited about this, and you know this is going to be a really big deal. And then you say, okay, so what's what's happening now? And you say, well, you know, we're going to meet again in two weeks. And you say, okay, that's fantastic. What's Andy doing between now and then? And you mean, what do you mean? What's he doing? Like, is he what actions? What actions are is he taking to show to show us that he is actually involved in a buying process, and we're not just buying him lunch? Yeah, it's it's a great point. Again, we use the the yeah. nomenclature uh, PIK or PIC for short. You use buyer action. I think PIK is a little snazzier, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I will. I will give you that one. I think PIK is snazzier. But, but the, the other thing that I would mention as kind of a final point here mm -hmm. is the earning the right principle, the earning the right principle. Mm -hmm. So we have to earn the right to everything. That's part of the entrepreneurial project is extreme ownership. And earning the right means that if the prospect didn't behave the way we wanted, we didn't earn the right. Now, sometimes we have a blocker. We have someone who's not aligned with their own company's needs, and they're doing something to meet their own um, selfish needs, like they're lazy, they don't want to consider a new vendor, or they feel loyal to an existing vendor. And the entrepreneurial behavior that may be required in that case is going over that person's head to the CEO or the CFO because what's happening is um, the foxes are one, watching the hen house. You're, you, you reportedly have somebody, you think you have somebody who's looking out for the best interests of the company, um, but they're looking out for their own interest as a, as a buyer and, and they're not aligned with the company. And so that would be another example of the bold behavior you know, uh, if we have a minute left, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a personal story. Yeah, please. Um, that's kind of at the root of, of, of this whole program, um, urgency-based selling, my program. Yeah. So I've started three businesses, and the first business was a sales agency where I sold packaging on a straight commission basis, mostly to food packers. And I had um, one very big prospect who really could have put me on the map at a time when I was struggling. And when I went to the buyer and I came with my bold vision, which was kind of like a custom look, mm -hmm. the buyer said, I'm good because they had an incumbent uh, supplier, a competitor of mine. Yeah. And, and after puzzling it over for months and realizing this was a dead end, it was exquisite torture this, this one customer could put me on the map, but they wouldn't even talk to me. I just considered that, you know, the, um, the ultimate decision maker was their customer. And so I went to their customer directly. And their customer was interested in my offer and asked them to work with me. So that was an example of a bold behavior where the person I was trying to sell wasn't acting in the best interest of their customer. Mm. So so that kind of like breaks the rules, right? Yeah. And that's what I feel we need to do. We need to be prepared to break the rules. No, I, I, I agree with you, Andy. And I, and I think uh, just an example for myself, back when I, uh, when I first was running Hothwaite Spin Selling back in the day, uh, it was, and I think this is a way of maybe presenting it a little bit differently for people who are on the corporate side of the culture is what the first thing I did is I went out and visited customers as you do, right? You know, I just come in as the CEO and, and the message I kept getting back from customers is we love your products, love your people, love everything you do, but you're difficult to do business with. And I was like, what, what do you mean? And they were, and they were explaining to me how 
we had apparently set up a bunch of processes and everything that worked fantastic for us internally, but frustrated the heck out of out of customers and prospects. And sometimes, you know, you maybe when people are saying, well, well, we can't let like sales take over the culture. You say, no, it's it's not about that. It's like, are are you as a company easy to do business with or are you not? It's a simple question. You know, it, it's a great um, it's a great point you make. And I think it's in the I think it's in the book Hooked. They have a great uh, example. You could check it yourself right now on this easy to do business because um, customers typically do prefer vendors who e when you have a chance, look at the home page of Yahoo and Google. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at the home page on the premise that your interest is to do a search and, and see which one makes it easy for you to do a search and then maybe reflect on who won the browser wars. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an easy one you could check on. Yeah. But I absolutely agree with you that part of the entrepreneurial mission is, is, is to understand what makes it easy to do business. It's a great point. Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks again, Andy. Andy's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah. So again, you know, we've been doing this practice for over um, 30 years, and we've worked with over 170 companies. In general, we've, we've identified about 150 best practices. And in general, we find there are gaps sometimes when clients invite us in. The biggest issue is usually sales culture. If you don't get sales culture right, and we advocate the heroic sales culture. Why? Because salesperson has to live on do or die versus best efforts, mm -hmm. has to earn the right, has to be a business seller and a social seller. So um, we're big fans of the heroic salesperson. And in the context of, of a, what we see as heroic selling, we teach what we call the standard sales call, a step-by-step -step process to win the sale. And typically, if there are gaps and, and, and we get brought in, and we get commitment and support, we see a 15 to 20% minimum increase in profitable sales. Mm -hmm. Just if I could mention, yeah. um, every month we have a free 20-minute webinar. Um, I don't know if your seminar will come out, uh, this interview will come out in time, but the one on March is about the second chance, how do you revive lost customers? And if anybody's interested, if it comes out too late, there'll be a replay. Fantastic. So thank you for that. Yeah, great, great subject for a webinar too. Yeah, because um, we often give up after we the relationship go, <laughs> goes uh, goes south. Anyway, listen, thanks again, Andy. Thank you for watching and listening, and I will see you all again soon.